Hello, Propanomics people, and welcome to the final Sunday supplement for 2023. As you know, I like to start with a quote, and this week's is, I constantly see people rise in life who are not the smartest, sometimes not even the most diligent, but they are learning machines. They go to bed every night a little wiser than they were when they got up, and boy, does that help, particularly when you have a long run ahead of you. And that's from Charlie Munger, RIP, the legendary American investor who passed earlier this year. So before we get begin, this is going to be the last shout out for the Proponomics Advent Calendar. If you listen on one of the podcast platforms, it's worth checking out the Proponomics YouTube for the daily posts that I did throughout Advent in December to celebrate getting to 500 subscribers on the channel. Thanks to all the regular readers and listeners who have subscribed. If you haven't yet, what are you waiting for? Please, can you recommend me to a friend who you think would be interested? I love the commentary, feedback and interaction that I get on the channel and I'm still at the stage where I can reply to every single comment. At the end today, I'll tell you a little bit about my content plans for 2024. So welcome to that final supplement for 2023. The one after the one after the anti-penultimate supplement. The ultimate supplement, if you prefer. Yes, I know it doesn't work like that. One more sleep until 2024. So we had some very limited macro content this week. The Nationwide House Price Index was revealed for December and the year and the consensus was spot on for the monthly at least a 0% print to round out the year. The consensus annual movement was minus 1.4% and it ended up, according to Nationwide, at minus 1.8%. The consensus expectation for the ONS 2023 print is more like minus 2.5% apparently, but we won't know for a couple of months. Other than that, we had truncated trading, just two and a half days worth rather than five, in the bond and stock markets because of the time of year. You know a lot more about the bond markets because of this year's efforts in the supplement, I'm sure. I'm not sure how many join me in checking on a regular basis, but I certainly see a lot more people referring to the five-year Sonya swaps than I ever did before, that's for sure. I'm pleased to have helped the cat out of the bag on that one. The five-year UK gilt opened the week at 3.306 and closed at 3.313. With nothing really to change it, that shouldn't be too much of a surprise, although it's worth looking at the range too. The lowest trade was a shade under 3.25% and the highest a little over 3.4%. So there was twice as much amplitude to the upside as the downside. However, I wouldn't read too much into this as volumes are very light on a week like this. The five-year Sonya swap closed out the week at 3.347% yield and it feels like a great end to the trading year looking back at a print of 4.035 just one month ago and 4.021 a whole year ago. In summer this year, we saw prints of over 5.25% on the Sonya swap. So that is a major drop since then. The 65 basis points just in the past month are still gigantic. And whilst the trend needs to continue and the pressure in the economic media is ramping up on the Bank of England, the reality is other than the rhino potential recession already referred to last week, that's recession in name only, there is no real significant economic problem in the immediate pipe before the election. And the economy is likely to rebound in Q1 2024, which will take some of that pressure off if the more hawkish members of the committee continue to believe that we need to hold hard in rates. I've said it before. I think the 50-50 market on a rate cut in March offers value on the hold side, just from analysing the previous MPC voting patterns over the past couple of years. So that lacro of macro leaves us in a nice hole to get into one final deep dive of the year and the timing is great for this week. The Bank of England have just published a nice juicy report in their quarterly bulletin entitled The Buy-to-Let Sector and Financial Stability. That definitely sounds like the type of thing we should be interested in. Remember these findings are hat tips to potential regulatory changes such as the 125% ICR rules and 145% rules that were brought into play in 2017. I'm sure you'll join me in agreeing they're well worth being in front of, not behind. I cast my mind back to when Mark Carney was the governator of the Bank of England and he spoke about the property market often, including landlords and buy-to-let. Mr C's impression, which was really educated guesswork rather than too data-based, was that landlords were the riskiest part of the housing market. More likely to sell assets in a fast downturn and offering more volatility. Of course, we would most likely have to agree with him. It is unlikely that homeowners would sell faster or more aggressively or at more of a discount in the face of a downturn. Buy-to-let landlords also face more expensive mortgages, 
with less tolerance on arrears and less consumer protection. Of course, we as landlords are strong custodians of our assets, <clears throat> but the argument would be the one we care about the very most would still be our own family home. Probably fair. So, Carney obsessed over controlling the market in the event of a repeat of a 2008 style event or other future credit crunch or event of significance. It was certainly more of a topic in the quarterly breakfast briefings that I've attended for many years when MC was the top dog versus Bailey. We've hardly spoken of property at all since Bailey took the reins. You might consider that a bonus, really. One fewer personal organisation that has landlords in its sights. However, what would we really want from an intelligent Bank of England? One that recognises that the PRS is an essential part of the housing mix in the UK? And one keen not to shock or drive many out of the marketplace with monetary policy, being aware of the broader impact that might have on the financial stability of the UK, which is, remember, a secondary brief to the bank, whereas the primary stated goal is to get inflation to the government's set target. And since that's not going well, and hasn't been for a couple of years, I guess we should expect more chat around the rest of the bank's raise on DETRA. This paper actually follows up on a paper the bank published on the 12th of September, which was part of the bank's Bank Overground series of publications, which is intended to summarise a piece of analysis that supported a policy or operational decision. I haven't line by lined it. The analysis is too graphically based and too long for that to be a useful exercise for either of us. Instead, I've opted to summarise both of those pieces of work in one, so that we can, together, start to understand more about exactly where the bank is at on buy to let as we come into 2024. The strapline on the September report is not catchy, but it gives you a clue as to where the bank are on recent claims around the buy-to-let sector and the overall landlord hostility that has prevailed since George Osborne's, George Osborne's genius policy to introduce a special tax for landlords by amending Section 24 of the Finance Act back in 2015, reducing tax relief on mortgage interest to single out landlording from basically all other businesses in the UK when it comes to debt but only when considering properties owned in people's personal names. <clears throat> the September paper asks the question, has the private rental sector been shrinking? And underneath it points out that an innovative measure of landlord property transactions shows the UK private rental sector has been shrinking for at least the last two years, but less quickly than other indicators suggest. <clears throat> it feels to me that the authors of the paper were coming from a place where they did not believe as many landlords were leaving the sector as was being claimed. But let's get into the detail and find out just how objective or not they were. They opened by recognising the reduction in profitability for landlords. At this point, it is a good idea to point out the distinction that the bank prefers to make. They are defining a buy-to-let landlord as one who owns one or more properties that they rent out with mortgages. That last bit is key because it is often forgotten. If you own a property or more unencumbered, you are not a buy-to-let landlord in the, in the bank's eyes. You're just a landlord or part of the rest of the PRS. They don't really have an exclusive name for that. It's implied that you are very wealthy, although of course this could be one property worth 30k in the far northeast of England, or one property you lived in 30 years ago and retained when you moved house back then, so you wouldn't necessarily be rolling in it in either situation at all. They also recognised the problem with measuring the size of the sector. This has been a problem for as long as I can remember. And I agree with it. However, we do have enough large organisations with enough data to have a pretty good go at this. The issue is really twofold. One, as an organisation, how can the bank make any decisions without the data being correct? And two, politically, you can always choose the better or worse looking data set to make a political point and be technically telling the truth. Not ideal. Being unhappy with the data, they're doing their own thing as a bit of a mashup. Understandable. And here's the criteria they are using. Matching the land reg with Zoopla when fresh data on rental advertisements. When fresh is one of the largest data aggregators out there, used by many big banks to make decisions. In order to work out which properties were bought with the objective of renting them out, and when properties that were rented out were then sold and not rented out, to count the other way. These then drop into three categories. Landlord to owner occupier sales, owner occupier to landlord sales, and landlord to landlord sales. It's an interesting metric which is likely better than what's out there. 
because what's out there really is disappointingly poor. It also strikes me as sizably flawed still for the following reasons. Number one, they use a four year time window between when a property is rented and sold or bought and rented or not to determine their graph. This isn't even the average length of tenancy in the UK. Number two, it's only England and Wales. With different rules, you might be best off leaving out Scottish data, but it's a lot to leave out. And number three, the data tracks FCA or UK finance data on buy-to-let mortgages until 2020 almost perfectly, then departs from this line significantly. It isn't clear why, but I suspect one of the reasons is this four-year time window. It all looks a bit of a mess because UK finance data is only tracking new buy-to-let mortgages when a certain element of the sector only proceeds in cash for a number of reasons that we all know. This isn't really explained, but I'm really not convinced on this new measure on which the bank is giving us an explanation of. The bank's new measure is basically showing smaller outflows than other measures. Hampton's produced survey data, which is held to be a good proxy, but again, I would have to disagree. Hampton's go no further north than Stratford-upon-Avon and have a huge concentration in London and the South East so their data data just can't be representative of the entire country. The banks show much larger outflows as a percentage in London and the South East. And that's what we would expect, of course, because the lack of gross yield, before we even start on costs, has been choking landlords in the South East ever since rates reverted to more normal levels over the past 18 months or so. They know the data isn't great, but their point would be that this measure is better than whatever else is out there. And perhaps it is but the number of Swiss cheese style holes I can see in it doesn't fill one with confidence. The point in the conclusion that they would have drawn is that the sector has only been shrinking since mid 2019, although the gap between the two lines has grown significantly since then. This isn't congruent with other numbers that show the peak PRS at 2016-17, which makes more sense as that's after That's a little bit of time lag after policy took a restrictive, if not hostile, turn at the bank level and the governmental level. Nonetheless, this is a report prepared by economists, not political scientists, and so there we go. This report was presented to the bank in Q2 of 2023, and the very recent report is a product of that analysis as well. This one goes into much more detail, which the committee no doubt asked for on the back of the previous report. Firstly, why does the bank really care because they want to measure or estimate just how much risk to financial stability the buy-to-let sector might pose based on interest rate changes. They don't care about the politics of renting and immediately seek to put all this into context when they frame the market. Some of this data you've already heard or seen in the supplement this year, but it's worth repeating. 19% of households are privately renting and of them, 45% live in a property with a mortgage. So of course, by definition, 55% live in an unencumbered property. That's the one I've really found difficult to get my head around. Number two, buy-to-let is therefore about 9% of the housing stock, using the bank's definition of the buy-to-let sector. Number three, the size of the buy-to-let sector is £300 billion of mortgage debt, or 18% of the overall outstanding mortgages in the UK, in systemically important banks. Number four, 35% of households own outright, and 30% own with a mortgage. These figures are slightly different to others that have been seen this year, but only by 1% to 2% or so. And number five, that leaves 17% of households who are social renters. Actually, there must be a rounding error there somewhere because those four percentages add up to 101%. We mostly know our history, I believe, and this is a reminder of the fact that buy to is such a young sector still. 1988 and the Housing Act made renting much more viable than it had been before, but buy-to-let as defined here was really born in 1996 with the advent of the buy-to-let mortgage. In 2007, it is recorded as having been 25-40% to cheaper to rent a home than to service a mortgage, because house prices had gotten so very high compared to wage development. The data, as always, says it best. Between 2000 and 2008, the buy-to-let mortgage is outstanding, went from 9 billion to 140 billion, a 1,556% increase. And yes, that's no typo. But in 2008 and 2015, this loan book still grew around 8.5% a year. Since 2015, it has been more like 5% a year, but still grown, hence the move to 300 billion in the most recent figures the bank is using. 
How does the bank perceive the danger posed by buy to let? In two ways. Firstly, the resilience of the lenders if landlords cannot service mortgage debt, either direct defaults on those serviced loans or defaults on other loans that landlords have that come down when the whole house of cards collapses. Secondly, the bank is also concerned about the borrowers, which rear here really counts the landlords and their tenants. They might have to cut spending sharply or sell houses depending on which side of the fence they're sitting on, but the bank is interested in both scenarios. The bank recognises there can be a compound effect here and that one of these problems may impact the other, something that got missed far too often in the run-up to the financial crisis. The next part is particularly interesting, the bank's viewpoint on their toolbox to manage risks stemming from buy-to-let. Number one, loan to value policies, limiting loan to values based on the FPC's powers of direction. That's the Financial Policy Committee who would instruct the PRA, the Prudential Regulation Authority, to change these if they deemed it necessary, having done more research. Number two, affordability policies. Firstly, the PRA affordability test, which was extended to buy to let in 2017, taking into account rental income, the borrower's income, essential personal expenditure and living costs, income tax liabilities, professional fees incurred throughout the ownership, the cost of voids, council tax, the cost of utilities, and the management of the asset the borrower is borrowing against. The second affordability already in place is around what we talk about as ICRs, interest coverage ratios, i.e. 125% of the mortgage needs to be the market rent to get a 75% mortgage on a five-year fix. Otherwise, the test is 145% of the mortgage which would usually keep loan-to-values lower, which particularly bites in the lower yield areas and led to fewer two-year mortgages being viable, particularly in the southeast. The remainder are capital policies, which I have not discussed extensively thus far. The technicals may well be more than any of us need to understand in too much detail, but they involve the stress testing framework for the annual stress test the bank undertakes on the entire banking system, not just buy-to-let. The counter-cyclical capital buffer rate and also the sectoral capital requirements. These final three are much more macro and somewhat abstract, and so I'm not going to go any further into those at this point. They are much more lender-focused rather than decisions about individual assets, classes, and whether a property is suitable for a buy-to-let mortgage. Now, into some more detail. Since September 2016, any PRA-regulated lenders have been required to apply either or both of these guidelines. Firstly, income affordability testing at a stressed interest rate of at least the higher of 5.5% or a 2 percentage point increase in buy-to-let mortgage rates. This test is used when lenders are taking account of a borrower's personal income as, it, as a means to meet mortgage payments, which we define as top slicing. Also, the interest rate affordability stress testing, the ICR testing, to ensure that rental income is sufficient to pay interest costs after accounting for maintenance and other costs of letting. Lenders tend to test affordability at a minimum ICR of 125%, assuming those stressed interest rates as above, and the basic rate of income tax. For higher and additional rate taxpayers, the equivalent break-even ICR is about 167%. In practice, lenders have tended to test those borrowers at 145%. If the political ideologues who detest the fact that there exists a buy-to-let sector wanted to have a reasoned argument, it is the second of these bullet points that they would disagree with. It should be self-evident these days that 125%, i.e. 80% of rent can be used to pay the mortgage, is simply not enough coverage. <clears throat> Compliance costs have skyrocketed since this directive. Maintenance costs have increased over 100% since 2016, well above this level of either inflation or rent inflation. Insurance has taken a steep shift upwards as well. That's before you apply Section 24, where of course as a higher rate taxpayer, or a false higher rate or additional rate taxpayer, forced into that ban by your revenue rather than your profit, you cannot expense all of your mortgage interest costs. 125% becomes a complete joke then, although 145% is a bigger joke. Still, the recent wobble in the market, thanks to rates rising so much and so quickly, has not flushed this weakness out of the system. Lloyds, the largest bank in the UK, tends to prefer a 160% plus cover ratio for all of its loans, and that strikes me as a much more realistic approach. 
it isn't all bad. I would hate a portfolio at 125% coverage, but if it was fixed rates for 25 years, I'd be looking forward to the annual rent increase significantly as the cost of debt would be staying static and be being inflated away by the capital growth and inflation as well. That's an extreme example, but just to give a little bit of the other side of the argument here. It's also worth quoting this directly from the report before my knickers get too twisted. These testing requirements do not cover all buy-to-let lending. They exclude lending with a fixed period of five years or more and lending by non-banks, which together combined about 75% of new buy-to-let lending in Q3 of 2023. However, banks also apply their own affordability testing standards outside of the SS1316 requirements, which are the interest coverage ratio requirements. It would be good to know what the split was between five plus year fixed by choice and five plus year fixed by necessity because the stress tests on lending shorter than five years simply priced these loans out for the vast majority of borrowers and was by a non-bank. A non-bank is an organisation that is not an officially established bank but offers many similar services. <clears throat> there was also a footnote to this comment in the report which has significant interest at certain points over the last 18 months. The requirements also exclude lending to corporates, consent to let loans, lending prudentially regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority, loans with a term of 12 months or less, and remortgaging with no additional borrowing. You might start to wonder what they do actually include. Assuming corporates means any limited company, this also excludes all bridges and all remortgages where capital is not raised, which will have been a lot given the price of the debt at some points during 2023. As covered above, it is reasonable to expect buy-to-let landlords as defined to sell more quickly than homeowners in the event of a credit crunch or other event of financial distress and significance. The data here that the bank relies on is what happened in 2008, where buy-to-let mortgages in three-plus months of arrears increased sixfold compared to owner-occupiers in three-plus months of arrears. They only doubled. Indeed, those whose buy-to-let mortgages originated in the 90 to 95% band back then, were three times as likely to default as homeowners in the same origination band. That in itself justifies lenders charging a higher rate for buy-to-let than to a residential owner occupiers. The risk of default trebles in difficult times. There is recognition that underwriting standards pre-08 were also rather weak. Some would say tracing paper or pulse optional for those who remember some of the loans that were being written back then. I also found the next paragraph particularly interesting, and again, I'm gonna replicate it in its entirety. During the COVID downturn, however, the buy-to-let market was significantly more resilient. In particular, arrears increased only marginally over 2020 before recovering to record lows. Arrears have since picked up since the start of the current monetary policy tightening cycle, but the increase has been contained so far. Much of this can be explained by improved underwriting standards which support borrower and lender resilience. The next section covers these standards and their effects. Let's see. I'd suggest that perhaps arrears also stayed low because of the significant direct intervention bailout style action that took place quickly compared to the complete lack of action that took place in 2008 when instead it was six months even before base rate was slashed. Inflation in wages and benefits has also helped to keep pace with rental inflation and also the prevalence of fixed rates above variable rates when compared to 2008 is significant. The next section shows, I think, why the bank is not as worried as I am over ICRs, but I would suggest I'm trying to be more proactive than reactive. I'm going to borrow another paragraph from the report. The median ICR at origination stood at almost 300% in 2022, up from 242% in 2015. Following sharp increases in interest rates since end of 2021, the ICR distribution on new lending has shifted significantly lower, reflecting pressures on the market. But we expect ICRs to recover somewhat going forward, as there is evidence that landlords are passing on costs to renters. And many landlords have significant ICR buffers. For example, 83% of new buy-to-let mortgages taken out in 2022 had an ICR greater than 200%, well above break-even levels. I'm not sure the 2022 ICR stat is particularly helpful. With an average of four to five months to get a loan over the line, loans completed in 2022 
were not more often than not at the old money rates of 3 to 4%. This doesn't speak to mortgages taken out in 2023, which are much more likely in buy-to-let to have been at the 5 to 6% level. And 6% is double 3% at the extreme. My point really is that I think this could easily be understating the problem. And one of the issues here, of course, is the lag in the data. 2023 has been so incredible in terms of the volatility in rates, really very unusual, that what happened last year may as well be three or four years ago. The text doesn't really match the image they use in the report. All of the improvement between 2015 and 2022 was wiped out and completely inverted by Q3 2023. And it's a great example of the stress that's been put on the sector in the interim of late. I would have used this as this week's image, but there's one even better and more informative one that I've opted for later on. So 12% of buy-to-let stock at the end of 2016 had a loan-to-value of 75% or more. By 2023 Q2, this was down to 6%. I'd expect this to have increased a shade since then, but if many have not re-geared or released capital, then perhaps not. I'm thinking of the number of loans with between 3 and 10% arrangement fees added on top in order to get the pay rates down to get under the ICR rules. This will probably all be fine with the pace at which rents are increasing. As I referred to above, if year one at 125% looks pretty glum, year four to five should look pretty good if the assets are managed adequately and competently. The next bit really surprised me and shows you that we can often all be guilty of living in our own little bubbles. The seven largest UK lenders, Lloyds, Barclays, Nationwide, Santander, HSBC, Virgin and NatWest, extend the majority of buy-to-let loans, responsible for around half of new lending. Specialist lenders and smaller banks add another 22%, building societies account for 15%, while non-bank lending accounts for 13%. I can't believe more than half is the big seven. Mortgage Works is owned by Nationwide, and they are the biggest, of course, but more than half stuns me. Just shows you. The next part is an admission of what we have all known is happening, and of course is driven more by George Osborne in 2015 than anything else. Historically, buy-to-let landlords have operated on a small scale, but the sector has been consolidating. Buy-to-let has passed its peak as far as Joe Public is concerned. More recently, margins on new purchases have been crushed by the meteoric increase in interest rates. In any business, when margins get squeezed and sectors stop growing, there is inevitable consolidation. This is just no surprise at all, but it's good to see it being recognised here. The next part of the analysis rests on the 2021 English Private Landlord Survey. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. The data for the survey recipients, 9,000 of them, was grabbed in January 21, which is basically three years ago now. Central bankers are never in a hurry, but this is so slow and the changes to the sector have been so great in magnitude. I just don't see this as that worthwhile. I'm not blaming the bank or the report writers here. This is just how bad the data is. As an aside, the ONS are overhauling how they report rental data as they know their methodology is flawed. They're working on it and it's better than nothing, but they are still an official statistic in development, as they now call it. <clears throat> I thought it was then worth replicating the next table in the report in its entirety. Imagine my excitement at a new acronym for Section 24 too. So, higher ongoing operating costs for buy-to-let landlords. Why? Well, interest rate increases from 2021 onwards and MITR removal phased in from 2016 to 20. The removal of MITR increased the ICR required for additional and higher rate tax paying buy to let landlords to break even on their mortgage expenses. <clears throat> and then regulatory changes. So we have changes to stamp duty land tax from 2015, imposing the additional 3% transaction costs on properties sold to be rented, which is not really true. It's just on second homes, but there we go. Capital gains exemption reduction from 2022 that makes it more expensive for landlords to sell properties. Basel 3.1 risk weightings in 2025 may increase lenders' costs of financing buy-to-let mortgages, particularly for high loan-to-value mortgages, of which there are few. And the forthcoming Renters' Reform Bill will aim to abolish fixed-term assured tenancies and impose new obligations on landlords in relation to rented homes. So, Section 24 to a central banker is rather known as MITR. Worth searching that acronym to see how often it comes up. 
I know the NRLA, Ben Beadle, and many other Section 24 campaigners will be pleased to see it mentioned in a report by the Central Bank for the good it will do. At least it is recognised as one of the main issues at hand. Likewise, the Renters' Reform Bill, the RRB, is recognised as something heaping further pressure on the sector by an apolitical organisation. By the way, if this is your first time hearing the Basel 3.1 Risk Ratings 2025, and it's the first time it's appeared on your radar, welcome to the club. It's not finalised yet and is on the desk of the PRA, the Prudential Regulation Authority that form part of the bank. But when it is, suffice to say it will be taken apart in the supplement. The problem with a table like this, of course, is that it's just a list. There are no weights here. Many would argue, correctly I believe, that sections 24 and 21, respectively of the Finance and Housing Acts, and their application or removal, are far bigger news for the sector than the additional 3% SDLT weighting. Of course, what's not recognised in the report is that that's 4% in Wales and 6% in Scotland. CGT allowance reductions is frankly a peddling, pebble in the pond compared to the sections. The punchiest of all, though, one might argue, is that little line at the top. Interest rate increases from 2021 onwards. Never mind the quality, feel the width. There's also recognition that higher returns are now available on lower risk assets. Yes, it's party time compared to three months ago when the bond markets were very high for us borrowers, but still orders of magnitude above where we were at, high twos for a five-year fix, to us praying for low fives with a comparable arrangement fee to the high twos days. They then follow some stats I've been after for a long time, <clears throat> and they put some real colour around conversations around affordability that are simply bandied around by some commentators in the industry with no real evidence behind them. As you can tell, I'm delighted. Remember, I am the geekiest of data geeks, in case you didn't already know. I must make this caveat clear here, though, and this is where data can be misleading. For this to be meaningful in the big wide world beyond the supplement of my love analysis, you'd also have to know the average age of a renter versus a mortgagor. I'd expect mortgagors to be older, but just how much older, I don't know. And here I am also making those assumptions but we need age to look at a proper cross-sectional analysis or make comments around social mobility. The ideologues wouldn't wait for that before passing judgment on this next part. At £26,500, the median renter's gross income is less than half of that of the median mortgagor, which is £59,000. About a quarter of renters report spending more than 37% of their gross income on rent. Among private renters, the median income is around 35,200, and the mean housing costs as a share of income is 28%. Renters also tend to have much lower savings to draw on than other households. Nearly 28% of renters reported having no savings in the NMG 2023 H2 survey, and about 50% reported having less than three months worth of rent in savings. This paragraph isn't really helped by talking about renters then private renters then social renters we are trying to focus on private renters here rather than just renters but it does give you a bit of context as to how different the income of a social renter is compared to a private renter compared to a household with a mortgage so 28 percent average uh, income spent on rent that includes london affordability x london is measured at 33.3% as a ceiling by most agents. The long-term average, not listed here, is around 27%, which shows you just how much incredible pressure is on renters at the moment. It is largely bluster, as evidenced in my works on this subject in July this year, the 9th of July supplement in case you missed it. The savings side is no surprise, although this is not comparing the average social renter versus the average private renter or the average mortgagor of course. The analysis is also somewhat biased to show renting as being worse than it is, because the comparators are cost of mortgage versus cost of rent, whereas you'd be better off using something like the ICR or similar to gross up the cost of owning a home versus the cost of renting one. Insurance, compliance, maintenance, arguably agency fees that you don't need, for example. So, now follows this week's image. This was the one I really liked, and it was very hard to select only one, but there was no doubt this was the one to choose. It is looking at what landlords may do and how that might affect lender and borrower resilience amongst both landlords and renters. 
Some might argue this leads to the least biased type of analysis that you will see in the sector. It's only as good as the data quality, of course, but still, likely a vast improvement over much of what you see in the media or from the big organisations who see forecasts as more of a marketing exercise than anything else. For those listening, these are the basic options the bank is considering here. <clears throat> Landlords might be able to raise rents and or absorb costs or sell up. Raising rents means lower income for tenants. Absorb costs means lower income for landlords. Selling up means potentially fewer properties in the PRS, which would lead to higher rents in the short term. Raised rents either way, because of fewer properties or because rents have been raised to cover costs, or both, would lead to consumption costs, savings drawdowns or defaults on debt from renters. <clears throat> fewer buy-to-let properties, in case of a mass exit, could also put downward pressure on house prices. This could lead to lower borrower resilience, amplification of an economic downturn and lower borrower and lender resistance resilience and the consumption cuts savings drawdowns or debt defaults plus lower lender resilience could also feed into making an economic downturn worse one more point lower lender resilience could lead to less finance available for buy to let which could lead to even fewer buy to let properties now this is supposed to be could do's and theoretical scenarios but I think it's pretty realistic for a downside case. I hope this report gets in front of the right governmental operatives for this and for the next administration. The worst case conclusions are then put into some context, which makes sense. Loan to value ratios are lower than the GFC, the Great Financial Crisis, and arrears have not jumped up too quickly, although they have been trending upwards and the data lags a fair amount, of course. The non-bank lenders are identified as the biggest risk, since so much of the sector is still funded by the big seven. This part certainly makes me think. A much smaller percentage of my debt is Big 7 across my own group, and my own pie chart would look significantly different, with much more exposure to non-bank lenders. Something to consider for all of us who are regular customers of secondary lenders. The three-month buy-to-let arrears rate was 0.6% in Q3 of 2023, and the three-month owner-occupier arrears rate was 0.9%, up from 0.8% the quarter before. So buy to let is still sitting relatively securely, although the bank does omit to say just how much of this has increased over the past couple of years. But of course, with lots of easy money around, arrears were even lower, as said earlier. A bit more in specifics directly from the report around non-bank lenders that is worth listening to in its entirety. But some non-bank lenders could be vulnerable to funding risks in the residential mortgage-backed securities, RMBS market. Around 9% of the buy-to-let stock of loans is securitised, compared with around 5% for owner-occupiers. The RMBS market is sensitive to changes in economic and market conditions and in investor appetite. As such, tighter financial conditions could restrict access to funding and or drive up funding costs for some lenders, especially those relying on securitisation. It might be pleasing to note just how little of the market is being securitised still, with the scars of 2008 still being visible to many, of course. Having said that, of course, securitisation in itself was not the problem. Incorrect risk pricing was the problem. The bank currently sees the decline in the size of the PRS as moderate. That is probably fair. It isn't the size in absolute numbers that matters, of course, however, a point that the bank don't recognise. The point made well by Richard Donnell in the recent Zoopla report was that when you have 1.3 million people enter the UK in two years, the vast majority will rent. So even with the same number of rental homes or a small growth, that's a gigantic amount of pressure being put on the rental sector. The next part looks like a fair assumption, although it does assume that people would not break mortgages or pay ERCs. I have challenged this fixed mindset aggressively over the past couple of years, as long-term readers and listeners will know. However, this is what the bank thinks, which doesn't look dramatically incorrect. Nevertheless, the high share of five-year fixed-rate buy-to-let mortgages reduces the risk of a significant share of BTL properties being sold at once, because the impact of higher interest rates is staggered. The share of five-year fixed lending has increased significantly since 2014, likely reflecting mortgagors seeking to lock in low interest rates. In addition, long lead times for regulatory changes give landlords time to adapt to the changing economics of the PRS. Fine, but this only lasts until the most recent five-year mortgage drops off for loans completed before the end of 2022, let's say. 
I'd want to be monitoring just how many properties were sitting on variable rates, waiting for that market to improve a bit before shifting them. As I think it's reasonable to posit, there might be a couple of hundred thousand such properties out there by the middle of next year, unless rates really are going to crash back downwards. It's also fine having time to adapt, but referring back to the image, if there's only raise rents and or absorb costs or sell up, I don't see alternative options being considered. And indeed, this analysis is incomplete, because as I've referred to many times this year, more active asset management strategies are to be considered. Short-term rentals, HMO, social housing, etc. All of that would come out of the single family PRS, but of course the HMO would stay within the PRS. <coughs> but this effect is being completely ignored. How active are buy-to-let landlords though, really? I'd suggest not that active, although you rarely know whether people are unencumbered or not. The bank has a model which goes through a stress test scenario of 30% of landlords selling up, which only sees a 4% adjustment downwards in house prices in the longer run. Short-term volatility could well be larger, of course. The bank also, of course, understands that Section 24 only affects 45% of landlords, ignoring corporates, as 55% are unencumbered. The bank has generally missed the nuance that interest is not the only fruit, however. It would be nice to see some robustness in the analysis here, although I appreciate they might consider it to be outside of the scope. But in percentage terms, what is maintenance inflation? What is compliance inflation? What is insurance inflation? Compared to rent inflation, and then also increases in mortgage costs, mortgages are a major cost, but if you follow their logic and numbers of a 300% ICR, that means mortgages were a third of rent. And if you are using agents, then in this environment, you are not likely not too far off a third of rent in all of those other costs banded together as well. I.e. the other costs of being a landlord are as high, or were as high before mortgage rate increases, as the mortgage costs. What I'm saying there in a roundabout way is that anyone with an ICR under 150% is losing money. Okay, that's a bit bearish, but it's a better yardstick than 125% as a break even in my view. For the next paragraph, I'd love to get some feedback here. Here are the bank's pronouncements. The gross rental yield on buy-to-let investments has averaged around 6% since 2014. But net rental yields, which account for property running costs and mortgage costs, have decreased significantly since mid-2022. For an average buy-to-let property, the net rental yield was around 3.5% in Q2 2022. Since then, higher mortgage rates imply an average increase of around £2,500 in annual interest payments for buy-to-let landlords. Full pass-through implies a net rental yield of 2.5%. I get this. This is accurate for a relatively mature marketplace, of course. Buy-to-let has been going since 1996, as discussed. And pre-2008, there were a lot of properties purchased with those legacy mortgages still out there. Indeed, the very largest omission in this report is just how many are on pre-2008 trackers. I have seen estimates of this data at around half of the properties out there, but I have my doubts as to its veracity. In the absence of a better measure, though, it's the best we've got. We are all very pleased that the bond yields are moving downwards when we think about new stock, because that's the relevant rate. Whereas those million loans on trackers are dependent on the base rate, which I'm still maintaining isn't going to fall as fast as everyone seems to now think. I expect at least two very frustrating MPC meetings next year, if not more. More useful would be the case for new stock, I'd have thought, because some discussion around the replacement rate, or whatever you want to call it, is needed to even attempt to model this accurately. This is the detail that the bank provide around their pronouncements above. The value on average buy-to-let property is around £260,000, the gross yield is around 6%, and annual operating costs, including taxes, are £2,350. I'm just not here, and I don't know where they get these figures from. Average rent £1,300 on a £260,000 property? Well, that sounds believable. But average costs 15% of rents, including taxes. In what world? Sorry. I'd really love to know where this comes from, because I just don't see it being accurate. Sadly, the report writers didn't reference this point. The next part looks very fair though, and I've replicated it without adding anything. Rather than absorb costs, landlords could seek to raise rents further. There is a risk that landlords cut consumption, run down savings or default on other obligations in order to service their buy-to-let mortgage, but we judge this to be unlikely. In the first instance, landlords are likely to try and pass some costs on to renters. 
UK private rents increased by 6.1% in the 12 months to October 2023, the largest annual change since the series began in 2016. Rents on new lets increased significantly more, by 10.5% in the UK in the year to September 2023, according to Zoopla, and around 13% of renting households reported experiencing rent increases above 20% in the 12 months of September, according to the NMG 2023-H2 survey. In the near term, higher rents are likely, giving rising mortgage costs and strong demand. 10% of renters in 2020 reported being in arrears at some point in the past 12 months. That number is now 14%, so the pressure of rising rents is telling. The bank then find a very clever and erudite way, which is a bit too long to replicate in its entirety, to say that they aren't really concerned about tenants in terms of the financial stability risks they pose, because A, they don't tend to have secured loans, they haven't got much to secure against being the argument, and B, renters can't cut consumption as much as others can because there's less to cut. Indeed, this next stat would likely upset a few because of its brutality, and you can argue over what is titled non-essentials, but it really is food for thought. On average, private renters spend £246 per week on non-essentials, compared to £177 for social renters and £384 for owners. By simple calculations, renters account for about 23% of non-essential expenditure, 14% by private, 9% by social, and slightly more than 30% of overall expenditure, 20% by private and 12% by social. So, we're about three quarters of the way through the report. Well done for staying with it. I found it absolutely fascinating reading, just because I do really value what the Bank of England thinks about our sector. In many ways, it must be one of the most important articles I've read this year. The New Year's Eve timing might not be perfect, or it might be. Other things are generally quiet this time of year, let's face it. Next, they try to address a question that many have been positing, but all have struggled to really evidence. Is the private rental sector shrinking? I think we know the answer is yes, and the real question should be, how quickly, and also, will it turn around and when? And perhaps how do you do that as well? The bank has the same frustration as I do and many others do. There are no available measures that accurately capture the size of the PRS. The bank's summary of the current measures. Number one, homes listed for sale within three years of being advertised for rent. That's from Paragon. Number two, implied changes in the buy-to-let mortgage stock. That comes from UK Finance. Number three, the number of second homes subject to capital gains tax. That's from HMRC. And then number four, real estate agents' own record of the share of properties bought and sold by investors applied to HMRC property transactions to estimate whole market numbers. And that's by Hamptons. This is the only external estimate to include a net balance rather than focusing solely on outflows. Hamptons data is not bad at all and their predictions have not been outrageous in recent times compared to some of the others who should be hanging their heads in shame at the, as the way they totally misjudged inflation and the price of housing in a tough 2023. We saw the bank's conclusion earlier on that the sector has been shrinking since mid-2019 in size, although they are keen to point out several ways that that shrinkage is overstated by the measures listed above. I think that's reasonable, but they do miss out this one gigantic point which we could divide into two and that is net migration. Since mid-2019, around 1.9 more million people have entered the UK. As referred to in that Zoopla report analysed last week, 90% plus of this number are likely to rent. A static PRS, let alone a falling one, represents a change in 2 million people in household numbers of 1.25 as the average in a rental household, or 1.6 million more rental homes needed than in 2019. This hasn't happened, of course, and there is just not that much void stock. So how has it worked? Well, in reality, several hundred thousand have come from Ukraine and taken up residence in people's houses to start with. HMOs have been created, I'm sure, which will have picked up some of that slack. Voids are halved, according to some of the semi-reliable data out there. And, of course, many are housed in temporary accommodation, hotels or in other alternative ways. Of all the ideological positions I hear taken on this subject, the one I never hear taken is that a functioning PRS could pick up this slack, which, of course, it could. Even if there was appetite for that, though, and some of the more liberal voices in the debate in 2023 have started to understand that controls are not the way forwards 
and started to understand this, that given the scale of the PRS and the lack of alternatives, that working with the sector would be the smartest and best thing to do for the tenant, it would take quite literally years to undo the damage already done and reverse this trend. Anyway, we're at the end of the longest supplement of the year, aside from the bank's conclusions. This sentence may at least tickle the heart a little. The buy to let sector has grown significantly over the past two decades and has become an important and integrated part of the UK financial system. The bank recognises the large change in comparative returns. Buy to let margins crushed, whereas other safer assets like bonds are right back in the mixer for many and associated retail products such as building society or challenger bank fixed rate products. Pressures are out there, but the sector has been robust. There's a significant amount of patting themselves on the back for the ICR rules and the rest of the framework. As I discussed, personally, I think it's somewhat weak, but there you go. It is better than it was, and I'm always cynical when anyone is marking their own homework. They conclude that even if there was a large exodus, prices wouldn't suffer as much, but rents would rock it. Put this alongside Hampton's recent claim that rents will rise four times as much as house prices as a percentage over the next few years. In a report, I will save for a future supplement. The savagery of the conclusion, which could be reframed as renters don't have that much money and therefore anything they do is unlikely to be a big deal, isn't personal. It's just a refresher of how brutal a discipline that economics is. They've done the same exercise for mortgage oars just this year and concluded they can handle it. And they've been right. So it's just the turn of renters to be discarded at the macro level. The best result for the tenant would be that some of the more lunatic foaming at the mouth rental reformers read this Bank of England report and make up their own mind. If any of them do read this, I'm very happy to debate them on a platform of their choosing. Not Platform 9 at King's Cross in case they push me off, although you'd have to be quite strong to do that. Feel free to share this near thesis with anyone you think would like to get involved in that. So the very biggest well done of the year for getting to the end. One final shout out for the Proponomics Advent Calendar. 48 videos now in the series, 24 60 second explainers, and 24 longer form explainers, which are all under 10 minutes. Subscribers are very, very welcome. And here are the links. Thanks for supporting me spreading the word. More subscribers will lead to more and better content. For the last time in 2023, keep calm and carry on.